Okay, let's start. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Saba Ghazal. I'm a periodontist. I'm a diplomat of the American Board of Periodontology. I uh, lived in the U.S. for like nine years. I did a education in different uh, specialty. When I went there, I took um, started at NYU University. I did orofacial pain and oral medicine. Uh, and then I did AEGD at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. Uh, from there, uh, I applied for Perio. I did my three-year residency and I uh, took the board. Uh, then I was one of the faculty there for one and a half year and I worked in private practice uh, and I did an implant fellowship. Then I came back to Saudi Arabia and uh, now I'm a consultant. I work in a consultant in a hospital, a periodontist, in King Fahad Medical City. And I work on uh, private practice. I teach in the Saudi board for periodontology. Uh, and I'm a mother of two, Yusuf and Yahya. If you uh, guys been to one of my lecture or see me on uh, social media, I talk about them all the time. So today is Saturday, it's a family day. So I try to manage and hide my kids, but if you uh, see them uh, coming by or uh, you hear them screaming, I'm sorry for that in advance. Okay, uh, I've never done this, so I want it to be as beneficial as possible. Uh, I don't know if it's not clear or anything. If you guys have any questions, just let me know. Uh, we'll go through the lecture and then uh, I'm gonna spend some time with you guys talking uh, about it. It's so weird for me to, to just look at myself and talk. I'm not, I don't do that, but um, uh, let's see. Uh, I love like teach, uh, in general, education through social media is such an amazing thing. And I'm just trying to be part of it. So uh, if you guys have any recommendation for Dentiscope, I really like this website. I've been following them. Uh, anything that is held by a young uh, practitioner, uh, uh, free education. I'm really um, a big fan of these things and I try to support it as much as possible. So let's try to make this as interactive as possible so I can talk because as I told you it's just hard for me to talk to myself. Okay so today we're going to talk about a um, treatment of patient with gummy smile and tell me if this I, I try to be as creative as possible with this so tell me if it's if it's clear. Okay, so we're gonna talk about uh, treatment of patient with gummy smile. And a, uh, this is such an, like to be honest with you, when I was in US, uh, we really did not have as much cases as we do here. So I really think, uh, although we don't have this documented or like a studied uh, to compare the number of patient or like prevalence of excessive gingival display or gummy smile in, uh, maybe the Middle Eastern community compared to the uh, uh, U.S. and Canada and all the other countries, but I really believe it's it's like we we do have a lot of cases here. Like I don't, I basically at least at least do one or two uh, in my practice every week. Um, so the part of like treating patient with gummy smile, what a lot of people don't know that this is a huge area in perio. And it's such, it's so challenging. The more uh, you know about this subject, the more like hesitant you will be to treat these cases and do it all by yourself. You'll find yourself like needing a, at least a consultation or guidance, guidance from a, um, a specialist or a, um, a more expert uh, general dentist who's working in this for a long time. And uh, the first time that I heard about this, it actually was by, uh, or like the first time that the subject was introduced to me was by Dr. Bill Robbins. He's a GP uh, in uh, Texas, San Antonio. And uh, he treats a lot of these cases and I learned a lot from him. Um, and I'll talk with you more about it now. So a treatment of patient with gummy smile, it's basically uh, part of soft tissue modulation around dental restoration. Uh, 
So uh, when it comes to restoring these cases, this is where a lot of us dentists notice that, oh, well, this patient have a, uh, a gingival display or excessive gingival display or like high smile line and everything that you're going to do is going to show basically. And here these cases... Sorry, I think something happened. Okay. So uh, when we talk about soft tissue modulation around dental restoration, this is where to the mosque so I don't know during the salah what we will do but if you guys cannot hear me just let me know okay okay طيب ف احنا نتكلم على soft tissue modulation whenever you have a case where you have to do some soft tissue modulation around dental restoration which is basically like an upper anterior any teeth in the mouth but when it comes to the upper anteriors or like lower anteriors uh, it depends on what the patient is showing. Here it will come like very tricky and you'll have to know how to deal with these cases. So I uh, come a lot of cases and we'll just stop whenever like you guys want and well, this is simple. Okay, so to know, yeah, you, to know a lot about this, you have to go to basics and you have to know a lot about mucogingival deformities and conditions so you can diagnose it and uh, at the end you'll be able to treat these cases or at least uh, say or like know if you can't treat them to whom to refer the cases or like uh, what to do with it what you can do and what you cannot do uh, and you'll find yourself like abling to do a lot of things and uh, but the most important thing is the part of diagnosis so restoring these teeth with mucogingival deformities, to know about this, let's go back to mucogingival deformities and conditions. So what does that mean? So mucogingival deformities and condition is when the patient have one of the listed conditions that you have here, whether it's gingival enlargement or like high frenum attachment, lack of keratinized tissue, inconsistent gingival margin, uh, excessive gingival display, decreased vestibular depth, or gingival and soft tissue recession. So when we basically are talking about or treating patient with gummy smile, we're uh, scientifically talking about treating the uh, patient with a excessive gingival display. And in most of the cases, this patient will have inconsistent gingival margin. So in simple word, there is only six tools that you can fix a gingival architecture with. Uh, and this, is, uh, this was introduced by Dr. Bill Robbins. And uh, these are either you move the tissue down uh, by connective tissue graft or you move the tissue up by crown lengthening. You can move the tissue down by extrusion or move it up by intrusion. Or uh, you can just extract the tooth and replace it with an implant. Uh, we can do a other like advanced surgery like impaction or like in cases of vertical maxillary excess or it's out, something outside of our hand, or it's like in the patient face, like plastic surgery and lips and uh, lip prepositioning surgery and Botox, and we'll talk about this. So it's basically something that we can do with the teeth. In um, perio, uh, we have two tools. In ortho, we have two tools. And in surgery, we have uh, one tool when it comes to the tooth by extraction or replacing it by implant. And if it's like something uh, due to a skeletal problem, we have an orthognathic surgeries. And in outside of the patient face, you will have the uh, outside of the patient mouth, we can do the fillers and Botox. So whenever you have a case where uh, you are dealing with a, like aesthetic cases, you'll, 
you'll, you'll have to know these six things so uh, you have it in mind and you can offer it for your patient. Okay, so let's go to a, a core aesthetic evaluation. The core aesthetic evaluation or the global diagnosis, uh, it's a, a concept or like a, a form that can help you to basically answer only five questions. And these five questions, as I said, uh, was introduced by Bill Robbins. And for the people who are in U.S., if you... Uh, he he do a lot... I think his practice is in Stone Arc, and he do a lot of... Uh, um, talking uh, on about the risk to side of it, uh, veneers and these uh, things for patient with uh, all these problems. And basically what he did, him and his partner, is they tried to summarize this uh, thing by uh, answering five questions. And these five questions will help you to diagnose and then uh, interdisciplinary treat these cases. Okay? So the, I'm going to go through the form and I'll show you guys, but uh, when we uh, talk about uh, the uh, core aesthetic evaluation, uh, yeah. so when we talk about the core aesthetic evaluation, you'll find uh, uh, part of the uh, form will talk about the uh, diagnosis of does the patient have excessive genital display. And when you have a patient with excessive gingival display, the first question that you will ask yourself is why? Why does this patient have excessive gingival display? Is this due to vertical maxillary excess? Or it's like it's a skeletal problem? Or it's related to teeth? Uh, whether that due to altered passive eruption or dental alveolar extrusion? And we'll talk about these in details. And then, um, or it's due to, uh, uh, again, uh, we'll go outside of the patient uh, mouth. Is it due to uh, lip length? Is the lip short? Or it's not short, but it's hyperactive. So when you have a uh, hyperactive mobility in the uh, elevator muscles of the lips, so when the patient smiles, the lips go r way high up. So let's start from outside. So when we talk about the lips, the average normal length for the lips is for female 20 to 22, uh, and for the male 22 to 24, and it increase with age uh, around one millimeter every four, uh, 40 years. Uh, but when we talk about hyperactive lump, it's the difference between uh, the uh, mobility at rest to full smile. And in average, this is six to eight. If the patient, uh, if the patient due to uh, movement, uh, there's a transition, uh, from like uh, uh, repose to full smile uh, of uh, more than six to eight millimeter, we call this hyperactive lip. Okay, so um, when we talk about vertical maxillary excess, and let me make this a little bit more clear. Okay, so when any patient presented to you, um, I, you're gonna start uh, doing your extra oral exam in the aesthetic cases, we take pictures and we do all these th fancy things. So I think it's worth looking at the facial proportion. And we uh, know that we can divide the patient face to three areas, which is the uh, upper third, middle third, and the lower third. And usually this will be uh, equal to this and equal to this. Third of the lower third uh, is a, the maxilla, and two-thirds of the lower third is the mandible. If we have the maxilla taking more than one third of the lower third, or if we have patient with long face where their lower uh, third is longer than the middle third, uh, these patient, uh, and this we can confirm by cephalometric and by referring the patient to ortho, might have a vertical maxillary excess. So it's a skeletal problem. And uh, when the patient have this, and due to this, the patient have a, an excessive gingival display, here we can go or suggest to the patient to do a surgical procedure, which are consistent of impaction. So where they basically do a fracture line here, remove part of the maxilla and impact it in. And usually this will uh, be with a surgery in the mandible. So it's, a, it's an advanced surgery and it's a lot of work for the patient. Uh, but you, you do have to put this as an option. Uh, so uh, I always look at my patient, and if I have a suspicion that this patient have a vertical maxillary excess, I always do an ortho consultation. 
So uh, the second thing that might the patient have, and it's very important to listen to the patient because a lot of my patients will come and be like, okay, um, I don't like my smell. I, I try to not guide the patient. And if they tell me I don't like uh, my smile or like my gingiva is showing, you really have to focus about what the complaint is. Is it really the gingival display or the short teeth? And uh, if it's the excessive gingival display, you really have to examine the teeth and see if it's uh, have anything to, um, if you can relate to uh, the excessive gingival display uh, by the patient having short teeth. Okay, so if the patient have short teeth, and for you guys, like as a GP, this is very easy to uh, look at and spot. Uh, you really have to know why. Is it because he was born with uh, short teeth, uh, like microdontia, or it's because of the, like the whole uh, coronal, uh, it's because of the coronal destruction of the teeth, so the patient have trauma or caries or uh, incisal attrition, or it's because the gingiva is basically laying down on the tooth. Uh, and uh, this is where, uh, due to gingival enlargement or hypertrophy, uh, or it's because, alter, because of altered passive eruption. And we're going to talk about altered passive eruption. So when we talk about eruption, we have a um, different phases of eruption. Uh, eruption usually started when, uh, with active eruption, which is um, the movement of tooth down through the bone and soft tissue. And it will be followed by passive eruption, which is the uh, apical migration of the gingiva. Uh, so the gingiva will move up on the tooth, and we're talking about the upper teeth, until it reaches the uh, CEJ, and then it will stabilize. In the cases of altered passive eruption, what will happen is uh, the free gingival margin will fail to recede uh, during the tooth eruption uh, to a level uh, apical to the maximum convexity of the tooth, and ideally to the level of the cement enamel junction. And as you know, this uh, will be um, this will happen with uh, gingiva move with bone usually. So if we, if the, uh, sorry, one minute. So if the, so if the soft tissue fall, fail to go down, in most cases, what that means is the gingiva, the bone is also high up on the uh, root. So um, how can we uh, diagnose that? Basically, when you do, when you have short teeth, and at the same time you can't feel the cement enamel junction, uh, we can uh, call the diagnosis of altered passive eruption. And I'm gonna show you guys here a video that will clarify a little bit more about this. So let's watch it. Tooth eruption is composed of an active. Okay, so you can see here. Let's go to the active eruption. So. This is a website if you guys want to look at it again. So this is what happened when the tooth actively erupt. So it will go through the gingiva and the soft tissue, and then it will stop once it reaches occlusion. And then the gingiva and the bone will recede down. But in cases of altered passive eruption, uh, the gingiva will not go down, and it will stay high up on the tooth, like what you just saw. So if that happened, uh, we can help the patient and elongate the teeth by doing a aesthetic crown lengthening. Okay, so the gingiva is way up on the tooth, and now you can see that the teeth are short. Okay. So let's go back. Okay, the third part, or the fourth part, which you uh, guys are the... Uh, are the expert in is the incisal edge position. And it's very important for me. Like if, when uh, a lot of people refer cases to me for the aesthetic crown lengthening or a treatment of uh, uh, excessive gingival display, uh, I, I will never do the case without an, a GP or like aesthetic dentist or a restorative dentist uh, involved in the case. Uh, and before I do my crown lengthening, one of the most important things that I want to know is the incisal edge position. Because as we said, if the teeth are short due to wear, uh, I want to know where your new incisal edge position will be because that will help me to know how much bone are we removing. And uh, if you're going to uh, elongate the teeth by doing a resto 
uh, things that will uh, make me decrease the amount of the bone and tissue removing that I will do. So it's very important to decide about the incisal edge position before any surgical intervention. So if you're going to refer uh, the cases to a um, periodontist to do your uh, crown lengthening, you really have to uh, give him a guidance, either restore the teeth or do a mock-up or uh, give him an SX retainer or give him the measurement of the teeth. You really have to decide about the new incisal edge position uh, before you refer the case to the crown lengthening. The more like elongation or like restoring the uh, missing part of the teeth that we will do before, the more like uh, uh, the less amount of bone and t tissue uh, removal that we can um, that we will be uh, able to do in the, when it comes to surgery. Okay, so um, we talked about this. So basically what we have to deal with in cases of excessive gingival display, it's either gingiva or teeth. So gingiva, um, after uh, this presentation, and if you attend a lot of like lecture and workshop, um, I got this question a lot, like can general dentists do a crown lengthening? I think you as a general dentist can, can do it, but the most important part is how to diagnose. So once you know or you will be able to uh, diagnose these cases and know your limitation and what, what you can do and what you cannot do, then it will be your decision to whether you're going to do it or not. But you really, the most important part is spending time and attending lectures and courses on diagnosis because I, as, as I told you, like even for me, uh, as a periodontist, I'm still like learning a lot about the, the other part of it. And I've seen uh, a lot of cases and I know how complex it is and how, um, how much of an interdisciplinary treatment we need to get the best results of these cases. So uh, we're either dealing with gingiva or we're dealing with teeth. Uh, and um, just put this in mind, and this is what the core aesthetic evaluation form will help you with. So the first two questions that you will be answering is the, uh, whether the, face, the fa facial proportion, the face height uh, and proportion, and the second question will be the lip length and activity. So um, this is uh, by answering the first or like filling the first part of the form, uh, you'll measure the face height and you look at the proportion, the profile, and you're also going to measure the lip length and lip mobility. Uh, you'll look at the midline a lot, and a lot of other details that will help you to uh, restore the case and give the patient the best result. The second part will talk about teeth length. So um, in the form, uh, you will fill the length of different teeth and uh, that will give you a lot of information. And at the same time, you're going to look whether the teeth have attrition or uh, why the teeth are short. Um, the third part will talk about gingiva. So uh, you're going to uh, see the gingiva line and see uh, if the patient have excessive gingiva display and you'll measure the display. So you'll ask your patient to uh, give you the maximum smile and then you'll measure the distance between the CEJ to the uh, end of the line of the gingiva that you can see. Uh, and usually if this is more than uh, four millimeter, uh, we call this excessive gingival display. But there is a lot of study that show uh, that when it comes to patient-centered outcome, uh, patient who have an excessive gingival display or if, of a more patient who have a gingival display more than two millimeter, they don't like it and they start to ask about treatment options. Okay, the third part have a lot of details, but the most important part, or like when uh, when we talk about the uh, Perio side of it is, can you feel the CEJ or not? Can you feel the CEJ or not? And that will tell you a lot about the, uh, and that will give you the answer of, does the patient have excessive gingival display? But as you guys can see, there is a lot of uh, other uh, things that will help, help you on Risto. Uh, so they'll ask you about the buccal corridor, the extension of the smile, uh, if the patient have wear or not, the occlusal plane. Uh, so for me as a perio, I use this form and I don't necessarily use the form itself, but I use the same concept. Uh, and then uh, if I work with uh, Risto, they use something similar to this. And I'll show you guys in here in a case how we do it. Okay. 
So when uh, the first patient come, we look at the facial proportion and we see whether the patient have a long face or we suspect the diagnosis of vertical maxillary excess or not. Okay, and then uh, this is where you're going to decide if your team will have an orthodontist or you think uh, you don't need an orthodontist. Then I measure the lip at rest and at a full smile. And there is two ways of doing this. You're either you're, you're measuring the lip to know if it's within normal limit or not. So as you can see here in this patient, it's 21, so it's average. And then you measure it at full smile. You either can measure the um, display at rest and then measure the amount of display at full smile. And if the difference is more than eight millimeter, you can call it hyperactive lip. Or sometimes with patients where they don't have the display uh, at rest or just hard for me to uh, to like ask them to just relax and uh, repose. Uh, it will. Uh, I usually measure the lip length and then at the lip length at full smile. And if the difference is more than eight millimeter, this is when I call it hyperactive lip. Uh, as you can see here, it's the difference is around ten millimeter. And I honestly do this a couple of times uh, to uh, verify and. Uh, when it comes to hyperactive lip, we're going to talk about the treatment option, but I usually don't jump to it. If I can do something with the, uh, with the teeth and uh, with the uh, risto side of it and all the other like, clear and well-documented uh, techniques and treatment options that we have, I do it first. And then I uh, tell the patient, if you did not like it or if you think it's not enough, we'll... Uh, move to like lip surgeries, but something that I will offer the patient from the beginning is you can try Botox or filler or uh, uh, other like a, a less aggressive treatment options. And the reason for that is we still don't know a lot about lip repositioning surgery. I honestly do it, do it a lot, um, uh, but we when it, when you look at the literature, the techniques, the stability, uh, we still don't know a lot about it. So then from uh, here, you can see the uh, display at three paws. Uh, and then uh, we go to the second uh, part of the uh, core evaluation form, which is the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the one that talk about the te teeth length. And here I measure all the teeth. And I usually get this information from my restorative dentist, but I honestly do it uh, again. Uh, so I can have, because this will help me a lot in deciding how much bone removal of a the right millimeter with the, okay, because I, and I don't necessarily use the form itself, but I use the same concept from my restorative dentist, but I honestly do it uh, again. Uh, so I can have, because this will help me a lot in deciding how much bone removal of I will do and if I need it or not. And as you uh, guys know, and you know more than me, uh, when it comes to teeth, uh, the average length of the uh, main two things that I look at is the uh, gingiva and the lip. So um, for this case, this patient, we diagnosed the patient with uh, alter, uh, sorry, um, after we did all the measurement, the patient, length of the teeth is almost normal. Uh, she has a little bit of recession. Uh, she has, sorry, a little bit of attrition on the anterior teeth. That we decided can be fixed by um, uh, Risto. And the um, other diagnosis that we have is hyperactive lip. Uh, so what can we offer the patient? So for a patient of hyperactive lip, I always start with behavior modification. So I ask the patient to smile I ask the patient to smile, and I also ask the patient to just talk to me. And I see, like a lot of patients, like when they're talking, uh, uh, you, they don't show a lot of like gingiva, but when they smile, they have the habit of like uh, smiling uh, or like uh, uh, elevating the lip way up there. So you really have to tell them, or start with with the uh, more like conservative approach of like behavior modification, uh, and ask them to. Try to hold their smile or like smile in a, um, I don't know, or not to smile, I don't know. So you give them the option of like you actually can train your muscle and not smile that way. And then from there, I give them the option of Botox treatment. 
and uh, if um, with a lip repositioning surgery or without. Um, the only difference though between Botox, we know that Botox is, uh, uh, is a temporary thing and especially for my male patient, I find it like so hard for them when I tell them about Botox, I don't know why. Uh, and uh, they, like most of them will jump to a surgery uh, and they don't accept the Botox treatment. Uh, but uh, when it comes to females, a lot of them will actually try Botox. Um, and there's a good percentage of them where we're also doing the lip repositioning surgery with the Botox. Uh, and the reason for that will be uh, is the um, longevity or like stability of the treatment. We know like Botox, uh, after a couple of months, you will need to do it again. Uh, for the lip repositioning surgery, we actually don't have a timeline, but we do have case, cases documented of a, a very stable, um, uh, a very stable like result up to three years. But all of that are like case reports and uh, we ourselves are like doing a study and documenting cases right now. But if you look at the literature, it's all like case reports. So what I tell the patient, I don't over promise them, but I'll tell them that we, uh, the lip repositioning surgery might say for a longer time, um, the result might be stable for a longer time, but we don't know a lot about it. And we can count the cases that we have in literature. Um, um, the acceptance for the surgery from patient is um, actually high in my practice uh, and I've seen good results with it so I'll show you guys in details. So for this patient uh, what we uh, did is we started with the resto part. I'll just drink water. If you guys have any question, let me know. Okay, so um, we, we did a lot of treatment for this patient. So we started with Risto, deciding what teeth are um, restorable and what teeth are not. And you can see here that uh, they decided to keep the tooth, but when they started the end treatment, the tooth was fractured. So we decided to extract this tooth and uh, the two six and replace it with implant. Uh, so she had one implant here and uh, uh, one implant on the other side at one five. Uh, other teeth was endotreated or retreated and uh, the uh, anterior teeth had uh, whitening and crowns. Uh, you can see this is an implant at the premolar. We did uh, implant, I don't know, if clear. we did implant and uh, soft tissue procedure, uh, a freezing of a graft and a CT. Uh, and then uh, from there, we place uh, our implant after a couple of months on the right side and the left side. Okay. Then after the patient finished with all the risto, all the other surgery, this is the before and this is the after. And uh, now the patient likes her teeth, but we still have the issue of the excessive gingival display. Uh, so from here, uh, we decided to go to the uh, lip repositioning surgery. I'll to me. I want you guys to turn your phones because it will be more clear if we do it this way. Okay, so I'll show you the surgery, uh, the steps of the surgery. So we start with measuring the how how much of an excessive gingival display we have, and then we take this number and double it. And basically what we do is we draw a line in at the mucogingival junction and from that line we take the measurement which is doubling the uh, d the amount of gingival display that we have and we draw another line which is the upper part of the incision and you will see it here. So uh, basically what you see here is the lower part of the incision and then the upper part of the incision will be here and this distance will be decided based on the uh, amount of uh, excessive gingival display that we have and we usually double it. There is basically two, two like uh, when it comes to the incision, there is two technique on the literature. We either do a, um, a classic or conventional uh, lip repositioning surgery where we take this incision as a one hole incision 
or we do the modified one and we do two uh, elliptic, elliptical incisions here, one on the right and one on the left, and we leave the frenum. And it's your decision what to do, but usually if there is a phrenectomy needed, I do the conventional one. If I don't have to do a phrenectomy, I like this. I just feel that I have a better control uh, when I do it like, like this way, and I feel it's a little bit more conservative than doing it the other way. So um, I'll show you the steps on the picture, and then we'll look at the video. And then from here, I do a partial thickness incision. So I'll go partially and remove this uh, band of tissue, and it, I will end up having this like two, uh, as I said, elliptical incisions. And then what I will do is from here, uh, I will suture them. And I usually do it with an interrupted resorbable suture uh, for a better control. Uh, because when I suture this part to here and this part to here, I want to have the same pull on both sides uh, because you don't want to do it like one side, like more cutting than the other side or like more suturing than the other side because you might end up with having a uh, tilted smile, which is, you really have to be careful of doing this. When we uh, go back to it, uh, I want to show you guys something. So when we uh, take, so I... When we take the superficial area or like just removing the mucosa, uh, for me, I tend to not to remove the muscle, like the band of muscle. There is, um, this is a technique docu documented in the literature and they try to compare whether we, like the stability of the surgery or of the result when we do a removal of like a band of removal of the muscle of the uh, upper elevator muscles or not. And until now, we don't have a strong study to support um, a better result or like more stable result by removing the muscles. So if we don't have these uh, kind of studies, uh, I usually tend to not remove the muscle and be very conservative. Um, but uh, all these are documented cases and um, if uh, it's, it's up to you or like the way how you practice, whether you want to do it or not. But for me, I tend to do it like if I do have a God, good uh, uh, studies to um, support what I'm doing, I'll do it. But if not, uh, I usually try to be more conservative. Okay, so let's look at the steps of the surgery at the video. So here I uh, took my, sorry. So I started with the uh, lower incision right here. And then I took my uh, 15 blade or micro blade and I do my, the dissection of the uh, mucosa, like this band of mucosa. Try to clean the area and, and free the margin a little bit from both sides so I can suture. <clears throat> then I make sure that the two incisions look the same and I start my suturing. Really do interrupt me. So uh, a lot of people ask, and this this is one of the questions that we had is like, where do you stop? I usually stop. This is why we measure the width of the smile. I usually stop to uh, uh, to be consistent with the width of the smile. So it's if the patient is showing up to molar, I go to molar. If the patient is showing up to premolar, I go to the premolar, and so on. Okay. So. This is how the patient looked like before, and this is how she looked like after. And this is a two years result. So the patient is so happy. Her teeth are like white now, restored. Uh, consider um, the gingival display is decreased significantly. And uh, this is the kind of result that we have by doing this surgery. If we do it on the patient that needed, and if we do a good um, work up in the diagnosis. So um, I've seen, a bit, like especially when um, I have cases referred for like repair of uh, excessive gingival display. Uh, and as you know, like as, a, as part of your work as a consultant or like a specialist in certain area, you receive a lot of failures and that's the best part of it because you learn a lot. So uh, when we receive a lot of failures, we know more, like we actually learn a lot from it. Um, part of the failure of this uh, is, I think, is the diagnosis. Um, if you 
really diagnose that the patient have a hyperactive lip uh, and do it. And if you also, for me, doing all the other things that we really know that it working, like uh, all the restorative techniques or all the other period techniques, aesthetic crown lengthening, uh, and these things, and leave this as an as an a last option. Uh, for me, this like a, a combination of thing uh, works. So just try to uh, spend some time diagnosing the patient and then um, give them the treatment option. But it's definitely a uh, one promising technique that we have, and I am a big believer of it. Okay. So usually the cases that we have are not that simple. The cases what we have is like a case is similar to this. And in this case, this is a patient that like it clearly have a vertical maxillary excess. And uh, she, it's important for uh, you as a general dentist to know that even if the patient, the patient have, can have a multiple thing and she can have actually all the things that we list. So when we ask, answer the questions that we have, the five questions, the one that related to skeletal problems, uh, the patient have, can have a vertical maxillary excess and hyperactive lip and short lip and altered passive eruption and short teeth and uh, gingival hyperotrophy and all these th things can happen at the same time. So, uh, so the key for success is to, to know exactly what the patient have. And the other thing is to uh, decide the sequence of treatment. So when ortho and OMS and perio and uh, risto are involved in one case, like the case that we have here, we just have to decide when are we going to do everything. So for this patient, she uh, was going to her like a, a surgery, and the surgery that we decided for her is impaction with the uh, lower jaw surgery. Uh, but before that, we uh, looked and measured the lip uh, length for the patient and we measure the hyperactive mobility if the patient have a hyperactive mobility or not and we also measure the teeth and we found this um, especially if the patient have ortho we found in her case that she uh, have an inconsistent gingival margin and a little bit of short teeth so before her surgery uh, we decided about the incisal edge and we did a aesthetic crown lengthening and this is how she uh, look like after the aesthetic crown lengthening and you can see that we did not solve the problem yet but it, we decrease it significantly and that's very important because based on this they will also decide the amount of bone, bone removal that they will do in their surgery so for me the sequence has to be uh, uh, first we do the more conservative thing and from that we move to the other uh, not conservative treatment options and the patient still went because she also need a uh, rotation and like uh, other surgeries so she all after this she went to her uh, surgery but at least we have now a consistent gingival margin and we significantly reduce the amount of uh, gingival display that she have and from here she can go to her orthognathic surgery so um, the other part of like doing these surgeries are let me put the phone here Okay, the other side where we might need to do the surgery or it's helpful to do the surgeries is if the patient... Did you guys not expect that that, that will happen? It's clearly showing that I don't know how to do this. <laughs> Anytime I try to move the phone, I'm just... Kick me out. Whatever. Okay, so the other uh, side of it is when we have a patient that we can do a lot of like uh, treatment on the anterior area, Clearly, the patient have an excessive gingival display, but this is a very sad case that I had. And uh, this patient have a multiple treatment that... Okay, so this patient have an excessive gingival display, but she uh, will need, we will need to do a lot of treatment in this area. So after ortho treatment, she had an ortho treatment, and then she started feeling that her teeth are moving. Um, and this is when, um, this is where the, the problem with perio is patient, uh, and especially for like self-referred patient, that they will, 
uh, go to the periodontist only in like when the disease is in advanced stages. So this is a patient with aggressive gingival, um, uh, aggressive periodontitis or generalized aggressive periodontitis. And also uh, she had at some point a poor oral hygiene. They did ortho treatment for her and they moved the roots of a couple of teeth out. So she will end up losing this tooth and uh, might be this tooth will have to do a treatment and of regeneration and other things in all her mouth to treat her period disease. But uh, when she came to me, her chief complaint was, okay, my teeth are moving, uh, but her sister wedding is very close and she doesn't like her excessive gingival display. So I know uh, that once I start working in these te teeth, uh, even with simple like scaling group planning, she's gonna start to have recession and actually her smile will look worse. So um, part of the diagnosis was uh, uh, hyperactive lips. So I have this treatment of like Botox and she actually went to Botox before the surgery uh, on my list. And now it's just a matter of like when I'm gonna do what. So in this case, I decided to actually go with the lip uh, surgery before for a lot of uh, reasons. And one of it is like her sister wedding and we're trying to uh, address her chief complaint first uh, and then at the same time I did my non-surgical therapy and I start uh, with the surgical therapy actually going very conservative and using the microscope and I delayed the extraction of a couple of teeth uh, to later uh, to later on with the treatment uh, procedures so or steps so you can clearly say that the difference between uh, repose and full, full smile is huge uh, for this patient and uh, she definitely have a uh, in addition to all the diagnoses that we said a vertical maxillary excess so I refer the patient to the OMS team and the ortho team and for a lot of reasons uh, this patient the surgery will be very hard for this patient and it's it's all related to the not being able to do the lower jaw surgery um, I'm not going to go into details of this I'll leave it to the uh, expert in the field but uh, they uh, told me that it will be very difficult to do her surgery in addition to her not wanting to do to do it and go through ortho again so uh, we uh, decided to start with her lip repositioning surgery and this is how she, how it looked like after the surgery I actually was like shocked with the result I did not expect that it will improve that much uh, and she is one of the cases that we're following and we're gonna document so she was so happy uh, with the result and uh, from here we start moving with the um, surgeries on the anterior area uh, and um, this is how it looked in a video after uh, almost a one year after the surgery. So she's definitely still showing uh, gingival display but it's when you compare it to before it's definitely much better. So even you can look at the way she's smiling, she's now very confident and she like her smile. So um, let's go a little bit more complex and we're, we're almost done with the cases, but here I wanna show you this case because this is what gonna present most of the cases that you will have. So when we started with the cases, I tried to show you a case where we did or where we needed to do one treatment option, not the other. But usually, as a general, especially as a general dentist, this will represent most of the cases that you will have. It's patient needing everything, needing gristo and like gum treatment and smile treatment and all these things. So uh, this patient that was referred to me uh, uh, with a chief complaint, I don't like how my uh, gums are and uh, they're not at the same level and my teeth are short. And this is going back to the first part of the lecture. You really have to know what the chief complaint is. So her teeth are short and the gingiva is inconsistent. So her, her main uh, thing is not excessive gingival display. But um, the inconsistency of the gingival margin, uh, we usually, uh, it, it is a very close diagnosis to the excessive gingival display. So you have to look at both. And the way how you can know that your patient have an inconsistent gingival margin is by drawing that line that we talked about before from canine to canine. And then when you draw that line or before you draw that line or like imaginary line, you have to look at the canine and see if the patient have recession or not. So 
you draw your line and you what we are expecting is in this line the gingival margin at the canine and the centrals have to be the same and then the gingival margin at the uh, letters will be a little bit lower you also have to see uh, your occlusal plane if your occlusal plane or your incisal edge is perfectly where you want it you have to also make sure that the patient does not have a skeletal problem uh, because sometimes I'll have cases referred to me for inconsistent gingival margin and then I'll find that the patient ha actually have a skeletal problem like they can't or like it's due to a rotation of the maxilla. That's why it looked like the gingival margin is inconsistent. So um, this is very important to know. In this case, it's actually like purely related to teeth and gingiva not being on the right place. So this is actually uh, after a crown lengthening was done to the patient. So um, the patient came to me after a, uh, a rebound uh, of uh, a gingival um, surgery or like a crown lengthening surgery that was done to her before me. And then the same prosthodontist referred the case to me uh, after the crown lengthening was done by another uh, dentist or a, like a periodontist. So when, whenever I, re I receive like, or I needed to do a redo case, I ask a lot of questions because I'm going to do it if, especially with these cases, I, you really have to be careful of redoing things. So if you uh, are sure that your result going to be a little bit, uh, a little bit better, um, uh, I, you can go ahead and do it. But if you don't know why the first uh, uh, surgery or the first resto or whatever failed, uh, to address the patient chief complaint, uh, um, I advise you to not read, to, to not to do the redo. Uh, so I spend a lot of time asking these patient question, and I usually tell myself or like tell the patient, I'll do it if I know how to do, if I know why it fails, or if I'm gonna uh, up, use it or like do it in another more technique or using a different system. You have to change something. So I asked her for a, after we take the proportion of the teeth, I asked her for a picture. I contacted the first dentist or like a periodontist who did the case and I asked for like a picture uh, for the surgery. And this is, this is the picture from the first surgery. And I honestly don't see, like, I don't, I don't see anything that will trigger uh, something on my mind or, to, or like a, something that will tell me, okay, maybe because they did this or maybe because they maybe because they did this or they did not do this, the case rebound. Then uh, the other question is for my restorative dentist is when did you restore the case? Did you temporize the patient after a, uh, the surgery? And this is very important because when we do crown lengthening, we want you guys to start modulating the soft tissue with your crowns. And I honestly, this is the most challenging part for me, especially in private practice, uh, because it's hard to... Um, uh, when you have a case is referred to you from outside general dentist, it's hard to um, make sure or like follow every single patient and make sure that they were temporized. So the way how I do it is I treat my plan the case with the general dentist and I ask them to book the patient after like three weeks uh, for impression and first set of temporary. And then uh, we tell the patient and we this, I discuss it with the general dentist and the general dentist discuss it with the patient and I discuss it with the patient that this first set of temporary might be changed, but it's important to start uh, modulating the tissue with your restoration because if you don't, uh, the tissue might rebound to the uh, first place, especially uh, if you have a patient like this uh, case where the patient have a thick gingival biotype. So uh, the risk of rebound uh, and when I say rebound is like the tissue going down to where it was, is a higher. The, uh, the only thing um, that I notice here, so from, from looking at this picture, is they did not do a, an, a significant amount of like gingivectomy and they rather chose to epically position the flap, or at least this is what I can tell from the picture. So this is the only information that I took from Can you guys see me now? The plan was to talk for 20 minutes, but I know I talk a lot. Okay, 
So uh, just to, I'm just going to repeat a little bit about this case. So when, when we save the videos, it, it will be better. So we were talking about this case that was referred to me um, after a crown lengthening was uh, uh, done. And uh, what I did in this case is I asked the previous uh, dentist or like a, a periodontist uh, to uh, provide me with a picture of the surgery. And I was trying to learn something. Um, and I also communicated with the restorative dentist and I asked them when did they uh, restore the patient, whether the patient was restored with a new crowns or a temporaries, a set of temporaries after the uh, crown lengthening procedure. So, uh, so we learned two things from the picture, uh, might be two things uh, that we know now is uh, re uh, technique wise, maybe a gingivectomy that was done was not done and rather an epically positioning flap and I'm not saying that we have to do gingivectomy I see that the technique that was done is perfectly fine um, but as I told you guys whenever I have another case I think about like okay whatever was done first I have to a little bit change it or like do a different technique or even with my if I if I do something and it fails um, uh, if I'm gonna redo it again uh, for a patient, I have to do something different. It's either I'm using a different s technique or like a more um, a different system or uh, I'll work more in diagnoses. I have to know why. Uh, then I'll move to redoing. I just don't just redo without knowing why or what I'm, uh, what I'm doing, basically. So for this patient, we know two things now, that the patient was not restored with a new set of temporary after the first procedure, and then uh, a little bit of details that might help us in uh, technique-wise. And then from there, you take your patient as a new patient. So what you guys are uh, looking at right here is this is how the patient looked like before the crown lengthening, and this is how the patient looked like a couple of months after the crown lengthening. So from here, now for me, uh, the patient, I deal with the patient as, an, as a new patient. And I take my uh, core aesthetic evaluation form and I start uh, working on the case as a new case. So part of the, uh, part of the re, what, we, what, what you might call a regional diagnosis of the uh, part of the regular diagnosis that we de do usually is charting. So when we do the charting, for me, um, uh, for these cases, every patient that will come to my office, I'm doing a charting, I'm doing bone sounding, I'm taking x-rays, uh, I'm measuring teeth again, I'm measuring lips, uh, height, and uh, um, the, uh, I'm looking at the mobility of the teeth, uh, sorry, mobility of the lip, uh, and uh, uh, I'm just doing the regular like perio uh, diagnosis that we do in terms of mobility and bleeding and probing and diagnosing if the patient have any peri disease. The way how I do my charting is I try to, uh, the way how I do my bone sounding is I actually try to divide or like separate the pocket depth, which is the distance between your gingival margin to the base of the pocket. And then the uh, other measurement is uh, the distance between the base of the pocket to the bone. Uh, and this total is what we call bone sounding, but I try to separate this, and I call this a true bone sounding, and this is my pocket depth. So uh, why I do this, and I do this especially with my uh, crown lengthening cases, because there is something that you guys have to know. Uh, the gingival complex, we do have a different gingival complex. So we have uh, what it called normal crest, high crest, and low crest. So uh, the normal crest is what we all know, that when you have a pocket depth of a, uh, around the, sorry, bone sounding of a three millimeter, part of this is pocket depth and the other one is the uh, true bone sounding or like the, you can, it's, it's representative to biological width. And then when we call it as a, a high or low, and I'm talking about high on the root. So when the gingiva and the bone lay up high on the root, uh, in case of low is when the gingiva and the bone lay uh, low on the, on, the, on the root. And I'll get this a little bit closer to you guys. Okay, so when in cases of a high gingival, high crest, you can see that 
the pocket depth will be, sorry, the bone sounding will be less than three millimeter uh, in the mid buckle and less than also three millimeter in the interproximal. So I'm measuring between the gingiva to the bone. In cases of low crest, and this is very important, the distance between the gingival margin to the bone will be more than three millimeter. But from here, I have to know whether all this distance is a pocket depth. Uh, most of this distance is a pocket depth or most of this distance is a connective tissue. So uh, that's why I separate it here. So when we look at the true pocket depth, uh, which is the distance between the gingival margin to the base of the pocket, uh, this is a pocket depth. Uh, and then the other measurement that we take is from the base of the pocket to the bone. Uh, we have to see in patient with low crest whether this distance is uh, mostly consistent of pocket depth or uh, it's mostly consistent like in this case of a connective tissue graft. Why do I have to know? Because this information will give me uh, a little bit of like a, uh, expectation for my procedure. When we have the majority of the bone sounding uh, or of this number is a connective tissue, the result will be uh, a little bit stable. And in case of crown lengthening, might be, the rebound might uh, increase in these cases, might, okay? And then uh, when it's not stable, it's, it's uh, what, what that means is you really cannot predict or the amount of uh, tissue that you're gonna remove have, you, you'll have to be more conservative in these cases. And uh, when it's unstable, uh, you'll, you'll actually, in this case, is needed to, you will need to remove less bone because most of the uh, measurement or the bone sounding that we have is basically pocket depth. So um, this one will give me more stability, but at the same time, and this is what, what where uh, our patient end up, at the same time, when I want to do changes or when I want to elongate teeth in this cases or in this scenario, I'm going to be a little bit more aggressive and I'm going to remove more bone. So what this is what we end up doing in this case. So the way how I do it or like work with my uh, restorative dentist and I ask them, um, I ask them first to do a wax up and then a mock up. And then I usually ask for, for two things. I want a... Uh, first to know where the incisal edge is. So if, if the incisal edge position can be uh, shown or clarified either with an Essex retainer or by giving the patient the new set of temporary before we do the procedure or restore it with composite or the, wh however you guys wanna do it, but I really wanna know where my new incisal edge position will be. That will help a lot. Um, and then the other thing is I want an Essex retainer or like, any way of measurement, and we do this now digitally, and there is a lot of details and ways to do it, to do this that I usually go to go to in details through my courses of like mastering crown lengthening. Um, but um, just to give you an idea here, like I want a, a way of uh, showing me where the gingival margin will be, the new gingival margin will be. So basically, my rest, what my restorative dentist did, or like prosthodontist in this case, um, they took the impression, they did their wax up. They duplicate the cast and based on the uh, a new um, set of uh, teeth, uh, they decided where they want their gingival margin to be. And I also want on the cast for them to write the measurement of the teeth, either from the new incisal edge position that they're gonna have or from any fixed point. So, and uh, for, for that will help me with like just double checking. So I usually use this and I double check the measurement by uh, the measurement that is given to me from the restorative or prosthodontist. So uh, what we did here is uh, we started with a gingivectomy, so we removed tissue. And then uh, based on that, we remove bone. At the end, what I want is the relation between uh, bone to soft tissue to be very close to normal, which you want your bone uh, for a good result and a stable result to be at least two millimeter below the soft tissue. Uh, in this case, we actually went a little bit more and then the bone now is around four millimeter below the soft, three to four millimeter below my soft tissue. So from here, I went to, uh, this is how we check. So I have the measurement that they give me from the cast for the tooth length and then I add to this my uh, four millimeter of, or three to four millimeter of like biological width uh, and pocket depth.
And I here I use my uh, the stint, uh, the one that I actually use. So this is the second time that I use this. And the first time I use it to decide how much of a soft tissue I'm going to remove, if I'm going to remove any. And now from here, I use it again and verify this distance here. Uh, so what I want here is a around three millimeter, uh, three to four millimeter, one millimeter will be uh, for my pocket depth and uh, two uh, to three will be for my uh, biological width. So from here, um, I suture, and this is how the patient look like after. So from this first set of temporary, what we know is only the incisal edge. So now the patient at this stage, like after three weeks of the surgery, she go again to her restorative dentist, who gonna take a new impression and do a new accept. Uh, and uh, the margin here will be where she perfectly want it, and she will start to modify the soft tissue. Uh, with the restoration. So this is how the patient looked like before. This is how uh, the patient, uh, this is how the wax up looked like. And this is how the patient looked like with the first set of temporaries. So you can see that it's very close to where the patient, the, the gingival margin now is very close to where the, my restorative dentist want the gingival margin to be, not because I'm amazing, uh, but because uh, we do a lot of workup. Uh, but if I have a patient referred to me with no information, uh, no like uh, a way of measuring the teeth length or a way of deciding where my gingival margin uh, will be, um, the result will not be uh, as good as this. So um, the other question that we have is when to, and I always have discussion with my general dentist about this, when to restore the case. Can um, the patient and the restorative dentist and everyone uh, is uh, pushing for like a sooner restorative treatment uh, for the final, but um, when we uh, come to literature, we can see that changes on the gingival margin can happen up to uh, years. But the um, one of our classical literature that we always go uh, with is the um, uh, Berger literature, uh, which is saying 85% uh, of the cases will be stable at six months. So um, I ideally, especially in aesthetic cases, will want it to wait for six months. We do have some studies that showing a little bit or, uh, of a changes between three months to six months. But I, honestly, for me, I would uh, love if the patient have uh, temporaries for six months, especially in... Uh, anterior cases, high smile line, where the patient is uh, showing and every single changes in the gingiva will be showing. Uh, uh, and then it's, uh, after we discuss this, it's actually up to the, uh, the general dentist and the uh, patient, but the patient have to know that there is a risk of changes that can go up to uh, up for more than six months. So ideally, we want to wait six months. Uh, if not, at least three months. Uh, but for more, for all of like my aesthetic cases, we actually end up waiting uh, six months with the temporary, and then we finally restore the case. So uh, during that time, I see the patient every three months, um, and then before they restore or do the final impression, I see my patient again. Uh, uh, during this six months, if any retouch is needed, I'll do it. Uh, and then uh, before the final uh, restoration, all the needed changes changes will be done. Okay. Okay. So this is when we restore the patient with the final. <clears throat> okay. The last part that I uh, want to talk about is the effect of your restoration on the gingiva. So you guys have to know that after we do all this work, everything can be, uh, we can lose everything. So uh, the, your restoration, the margin of the restoration, the presence of like any local factor can affect the results. So you really have to know about the effect of tooth supported dental restoration, uh, uh, the effect of the uh, tooth supported dental restoration on the surrounding periodontium. So um, if uh, starting with overhang, so the idea in simple words is if you, with your dental restoration have any uh, whether it's on the design or on the margin, any way of 
um, increasing the amount of plaque that will accumulate in the area, you're risking the gingival margin to change, uh, whether it's going to be uh, or it will start with gingivitis or gingival inflammation or gingival hypertrophy. Uh, ending with bone loss. So any any like a very small changes, even if it's like a uh, uh, an uh, overhang margin that you really think it's a little bit and it, the patient can live with it. Uh, for us as a periodontist, we really uh, are meticulous when it comes to this because we don't want anything to affect the result of uh, the uh, the result of the crown lengthening that we did. Uh, so whether it's a patient that you restore without doing anything on the gingiva or it's a patient that you restore with after you're receiving the patient from a periodontist after like a crown lengthening surgery is done or whether it's a patient where you did the crown lengthening for a single tooth, you really have to um, be careful when, it, when you restore the tooth. So we don't want any overhang margins because overhang margin is one of the secondary local factor uh, for uh, perio disease. Uh, and the margin location is very important. You, we really don't want any violation of the biological width. So your margin have to be at or a little bit below the gingival margin, uh, gingival margin, but it's within the sulcus. So we don't want anything to be very close or touch the um, uh, biological width or intervene or violate the biological width because we can have a lot of problems with that. So uh, this is the second etiological fact. Uh, this is uh, one, also one of the secondary etiological factor for period disease. The contour uh, of the crown uh, over, over and I, to be honest with you guys, this is one of the most, uh, uh, this is one of the most uh, factors that I've seen after like I have patient for maintenance after the finally restored, which is uh, improper uh, crown contour or like whether it's that uh, uh, over contoured or it just, it's just not smooth. So you really have to communicate with your lab and make sure that after you restore the patient, you're taking x-ray and you're basically trying to, to use the floss yourself and see if it's smooth or not and take an x-ray and decide on the x-ray whether that is an, an over contoured crown or not. Uh, because if it is, you have to think about that area in the maximum, like after the maximum convexity of the uh, crown and make sure that the patient can clean it very smoothly. But if they get their floss in and it's hanging or it's not going in smoothly, you know and I know that they're not gonna clean the area and that will affect our result. Uh, open contact is also one of the area that a lot of people miss and, and even margin. So you really, uh, we have to have a um, a contact that where the patient can actually or like easily floss, but at the same time we don't want to we don't want open contact. There is a study, uh, uh, there is literature uh, supporting an open contact being a uh, or like a direct relation between open contact and deep pockets. Uh, and open contacts are one of the secondary etiological factor for period disease. So uh, I'm going to end up with this case, um, and then I'll take your questions. So this is a, uh, an example of a patient where we uh, actually did the two surgeries together, which is the crown lengthening and the uh, lip repositioning surgery. Uh, so this patient presented to me with I don't, uh, the same complaint, I don't like my smile, and um, I don't like how much of a gingiva I'm showing when I'm smiling. So um, we started with the extra oral exams, and now uh, we measure the lip at uh, repose and full smile. We uh, also measure the gingival display and take the uh, length of the teeth. And again, we're answering five questions. Um, uh, does uh, five questions related to uh, if the patient have a skeletal problems or not? If the patient have a, f a problem, and that will be answered by the uh, facial proportion of the teeth, facial proportion of the uh, face and face length, uh, if the patient have a long face, all these things will uh, give us the hint of diagnosis of uh, vertical maxillary excess, which this patient might have. Um, the second thing is related to lip. So now we measure the lip. We see if the lip length is normal. And in her, in her case, it was normal. But when she go to, it was a little bit short, but when she go to full smile, uh, the difference between the repose and full smile is more than eight millimeters. So we give her the diagnosis of um, uh, hyperactive lip.
Okay. And then uh, the third question is related to uh, teeth length and whether the patient have short teeth or not. And she does have a short teeth. And now we have uh, to uh, see, um, go to the fourth question that whether we can feel the cemento enamel junction or not. And in her case, we couldn't feel the cemento enamel junction. So we give this patient also diagnosis of uh, hyper um, um, altered passive eruption. So uh, then the um, other thing that we're going to see is the, uh, we're going to draw the line and I'll show you another picture of the gingival margin and we'll see if it's consistent or not. And you can clearly say that, say, uh, say, see that it's not consistent and we have a little bit of extrusion of these teeth. So we gather all this information and we uh, put together our treatment plan. Uh, so I'm just going to focus about the periocide of this patient, what we uh, decided to do patient uh, what we decided to do is a combination and we did it at the same time of aesthetic crown lengthening and lip repositioning surgery so uh, this is uh, the measurement of the teeth and the gingival display and then from here we measure how much of a gingival we want to remove to um, to give the patient the uh, proper teeth length uh, so she doesn't have any attrition or I think the incisal edge position was verified to be in a good position. Uh, and then from here we decided to remove uh, a th around three millimeter of soft tissue. And then based on that, we're gonna move the bone, okay? And then uh, this is how it looked like just for you guys to see the difference between the gingiva, uh, where it was here and where it is. So three millimeter make a huge difference. So here, it was here, and then after we did all the measurement, we decided to remove, as I told you guys, around three millimeter. So if I draw a line here, I want this to be consistent. The gingival margin at the canine, like the gingival margin at the central, and the lateral is a little bit lower than this. So um, from here, we uh, did our um, aesthetic crown lengthening, and at the same time, we did the uh, lip repositioning surgery. The, uh, the most important thing is you have to make sure that you have enough keratinized tissue here. And that's uh, the tricky part of like a crown lengthening. So uh, we uh, usually give a lot of details about this when we specifically talk about mastering crown lengthening. Uh, so when you, uh, it's, it's really important for you to measure the amount of keratinized tissue before you decide about like uh, how much of a gingiva you can cut. Then if you want to move your gingival margin uh, like more down and you don't have enough keratinized tissue to cut, then we use the approach of apical position and flap. So uh, from here, uh, this is another video that will show you uh, how it looked like after. Now the gingival margin is consistent and then we have our sutures here. We uh, see the patient after a couple of weeks and this is how the um, and this, this case you guys can see on my Instagram. This is how the patient looked like uh, after one year. So now she's happy. She actually uh, uh, ended up uh, not doing any uh, Botox treatment on the uh, lip. We will, um, um, as I told you guys, sometimes we'll do the surgery and the Botox treatment together, whether you do the Botox first or the Botox after. Uh, and this is one of the cases where I was thinking to do that due to the amount of like gingiva she's showing, but she ended up with a good result and she was happy and that will be it. So take home messages, uh, and I'm just going to fix this and I'll talk to you guys one minute. Okay, so um, so the, as you guys saw, the most important part will be the diagnosis. So you really have to spend a good time uh, diagnosing the cases. Uh, and it is okay to ask for help. So if you think that you need a perio consultation or like an ortho consultation, just do a lot of consultation in the beginning, then make your decision whether you want to see these cases or do these cases by yourself or you wanna refer them. There is a lot that you can do by yourself. Uh, I think when it comes to treatment of gummy smile, uh, especially in cases where you're gonna restore and also treat the uh, excessive gingival display, you really need a team. 
uh, and then uh, it's a, it depends on like how much you will know uh, to take the decision of how much you can do. But the first part, like especially in the first uh, couple of years of your career, uh, you really have to learn a lot about diagnosis and how to diagnose the case and how to refer the cases and see the cases after the referral, see the cases after the treatment and see how much of a um, uh, see how much of a change is, what was done, uh, attend uh, surgeries with the periodontist and surgeons, attend uh, ortho treatment plans, uh, attend courses, uh, because you're going to learn a lot. And for me personally, uh, I learn like every, every time I see these cases and see uh, what Risto or what you guys as a GP can do to them uh, or can, what treatment option you can give them, I learn a lot. Uh, so... Um, now I think it's, it's, it's a great benefit uh, of uh, me. And I, I remember even in residency, I used to go a lot and uh, stay in the PROS lab and I try to learn a lot from them uh, because that will help you on understanding where your treatment will fall in and how can you help the patient. And it also, it also would, it will help you on like offering the patient the other treatment option or what your colleagues or what your general dentist can offer the patient. And it helps me a lot in referral because now I know I receive a lot of like, especially with excessive gingival display, they, the patient will self-refer themselves to me. So I'll receive a lot of cases. And when I see the case, I'll, like, I'll know now when uh, I want to involve an ortho on my team or like what my uh, restorative dentist or general dentist can offer the patient. Uh, again, uh, I, I learned that by working a lot with the general dentist and by uh, spending a lot of time with Risto and Pros. So uh, the key uh, for success for these cases is um, uh, learn a lot from other uh, specialty uh, and also diagnoses. Spend a good time uh, in diagnosing uh, these cases. Uh, if you guys have any question about any of the cases um, that you have, you can send me uh, at any time. Um, uh, I'll post my uh, Instagram here. I try to be as active as possible. Uh, I honestly love working with GPs, and I learn a lot from you guys. And I, um, like, we all learn by ex exchanging knowledge, and uh, that's what that's the that's what we have. Uh, that's what all of us have to do. So we learn from each other all the time. So send me your questions at any time and send me your cases and uh, we'll, I'll help you the best way that I can. Uh, thank you guys for having me. Thank you, Dentoscope. And um, I'm looking for uh, more of your question. I wanna answer a couple of the questions that came uh, to me. I think I answered it all, but uh, uh, there is a lot of questions about uh, my education or like how I did it. and. Let me see. I'll give you guys a couple of minutes to answer questions. <clears throat> Let me see. Let's see. Let's look at the questions. Okay. Uh, how can I do what I love in dentistry? So um, I have a lot of questions related to my education. So if you guys want to hear the answer, you can stick around. And uh, if not, that will be the end of my uh, lecture. Uh, regarding uh, part one and part two, I advise you guys to go to my YouTube channel. We have a videos. Uh, it's the I'll, I'll post it later, but we have a lot of videos about not a lot. We have some videos to answer your question about part one and part two, uh, which I think now they are combined. Um, why I chose uh, U.S. Um, um, I, I always wanted to study abroad, but uh, honestly, uh, one of the main reasons is my. Uh, husband was going to continue his education in the U.S. and uh, he was one of the first ones that exposed me. He's a dentist too. He's an endodontist. He exposed me to uh, education in the U.S. because before, you know, I did most of my education here, so we didn't know a lot about it. So um, I was going to go to maxillofacial, uh, and that was my passion. And I, I was like, there's no question that I will do that. 
And then uh, when I visited U.S. and get exposed more to Perio, I love, I fall in love with Perio, and I like how they teach it there. Uh, and I'm always up to like trying new things and having a new experience. So uh, that was one of my main like motivation for uh, going outside and continuing my study abroad. And then the other thing was is I spend a lot of time with a. Uh, the, the specialist who graduated from U.S. and I just always like think or find that they um, have a different approach in doing things. So uh, I just fall in love with the idea and um, continue with it and I decide to go. How can I do what I love in dentistry? You just uh, first have to know what you really love and then uh, you just decide to do it and do it. I think that's how you can. Uh, you have to be determined and focused, and I think the key is to know what you want to do. Okay, there is a lot of questions about the uh, studying part. Um, uh, maybe we can do a lot of, a lot, another session for this, uh, but you guys can go to my uh, YouTube channel or like my Twitter. Uh, we post, especially when it comes to the application uh, time, or like around May. Uh, I'll re I usually repost all these vid videos about the past and MPD 1 and 2 uh, and all these things. Okay, thank you guys for having me. I'll go see my kids and thank you very much. Yeah, I'll save it. I'll save it and upload it. Yeah, the, uh, just one more thing. Uh, yes, I will save it and we will upload it. It will be on the Dentoscope uh, website. Thank you, guys. Okay. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.